Okay, dear students, today we start with our lecture number 24, Social Linguistics. Now, like I told you in the previous lecture, I'm going to be giving you a briefing and introduction of Social Linguistics once again to refresh your memory so that uh, the relation between language and society is clear to you once again. So before going into too much detail, then I would like to tell you about, because we were studying in the previous lecture, about the uh, different uh, types of languages and the way they are used. So uh, once again I would like to go back to the introduction of social linguistics in which we are going to speak about different dialects, the varieties of dialects, grammatical accuracy, different uh, language communities and language vocabulary. So <clears throat> when we uh, go about uh, discussing the introduction to so uh, social linguistics. So we would say that, it, like once again I would explain that uh, it's a study of language in relation to society <coughs> and uh, how language is meant for society. So there are major English uh, journals also devoted to this and you can check them out. So, so uh, social linguistics basically throws light on both the nature of language and the nature of society also. So when we are talking about the introduction of social uh, linguistics it is that in a society we find different languages and dialects to represent the speaker's native place. So what we are doing is we are talking about uh, where the speakers belong from and uh, their different uh, place, places in society. So now every country has its own standard language with a number of dialects and uh, which are divided into different isoglosses like we were discussing. Now they have their own lexicon or grammar and culture. So every society has their own grammar structures, own lexicon, all, own vocabulary according to their own culture. Now two dialects may be comprehensible if they are neighboring isoglosses. So but if the distance is greater, the two dialects may not be comprehensible. So if they're, if they're closer in distance, then yes, you can say that um, it's very easy to understand and say that uh, the, both languages are very similar, even though the dialects might be different. But sometimes uh, two dialects could be of neighboring isoglosses. And in that case, so uh, if the distance is greater, the two dialects may not be comprehensible. <coughs> you can't understand them clearly. So hence, uh, in this case, the speakers have to face difficulty in communication. And uh, they would, hence they would state, or notion has a national uh, language or common language which, they, um, which the speakers of the isoglosses know. And um, uses uh, the use of the social interactions. So um, when we say that the dialect is uh, used in a regional basis and sometimes it covers a very large area and uh, has variations on some frequent distances. Now for example the uh, Germanic um, had in the beginning let's say that uh, three major dialects. So in uh, Germany, they had three major dialects today in the start. One was North Germanic, one was East Germanic, and one was West Germanic. <coughs> so they divided it in uh, German language into three different dialects or categories. All these three dialect varieties uh, were spoken in a very large area. So uh, each had uh, sub-varieties, for example, the North Germanic or Old Norse um, uh, had two dialectical areas such as the West Scandinavian and the East Scandinavian. Now which were further divided into Icelandic, Norwegian, um, Faroese and Danish, Sweden, Gutnish respectively. So the East Germanic also have three varieties of dialects. Now Burgundian, Vandal and Gothic. The West Germanic had four varieties of dialects. So Old High German, Old Saxon, Old Low uh, Franconian and Anglo Frisian. So the uh, Anglo-Frisian includes Old English and the Old Frisian language. Now, like other subjects, when we talk about uh, social linguistics, uh, social linguistics is partly empirical and partly theoretical. 
So it has both of those issues. It's theoretical and empirical. And partly a matter of going out and amassing bodies of facts and partly of sitting back and thinking about it. <clears throat> so the common approach to social linguistics can be fairly productive. Uh, whether it is based on facts collected in systematic way as a part of research or simply on uh, one's own experience. So either you can collect the facts as a, a research or you could base this start, uh, research on your own experiences of how you experience languages in different societies. So um, and what we would say that, uh, but in both the cases, the study is based on the analytical facts. Now, the analytical facts, the society has been divided into different groups uh, on the basis of ca uh, castes and classes and religions. So you can see that different people have been judged according to the different caste that they belong from or uh, the different religions that they belong from. Or um, so society like puts them into divisions, puts them into a variety of divisions. So they all have distinct ways of communication also. The people belonging to upper class speak a civilized language and which has grammatical accuracy and uh, well-selected appropriate words because of their educated family background and inheritance. So they also interact with the educated and higher class people uh, also. So the people belonging to lower class um, cannot avail all these opportunities even if uh, after they have been educated. So the upper class has, because they have an educated family background, they have links and they go to, um, they meet uh, uh, different people, so they have a more civilized way of <coughs> language. And um, <coughs> people to, from a lower uh, middle uh, class would have difficulty because even if they are educated, they still don't have that finesse in the language that perfection. So it is because they have to learn the language. So that's why. Now they cannot inherit it from their family tradition. Now uh, their interaction also will be with the lower class people. So the language of both the classes will vary. The upper class and the lower class. Now a religious person will uh, use the terms relating to religion in a speech which, um, a, is a com which a common man would lack to do. So um, in society now certain castes are traditionally educated uh, and rich also. So they will have lexical and grammatical control uh, which the people of lower classes uh, lack also. So the people of upper class, uh, caste or class may use the standard language, but the lower caste or class people um, will frequently use the native language. Now, when people uh, who work in some offices will speak with their colleagues a uh, different language when, uh, which they use in their family um, or in his village or in the classroom, in a shop or on a railway platform, in an agricultural field with the laborers, thus we see a person has to use varieties of language to interact in the society. So the la People, you, when you are interacting in a society, you need to use different ways or different methods of different language. So uh, what we would say is that um, the language he uses with his father is not uh, used with his friends. So when you are speaking with your parents, you would maybe speak in a more formal uh, manner, in a formal way, and it would be very different from uh, the way you would speak with your friends. Now, when you are speaking with your friends, you are speaking in a more relaxed, uh, informal way than in a formal method. So uh, sometimes, yes, uh, the language would differ or the way you speak would be different. Now, he makes a communication with his father or respectable elderly persons with a lexical control and maintaining the grammatical accuracy he does not um, maintain or make use of with his friends. So maybe with his parents or them he would be more, um, more accurate and more formal in his language selection. 
And so he will gossip and talk in loose manner with his friends. He will use the commanding language with his son or students also. So his language may be suggested rather than to be mild with request. And he may use the commanding language with the servant, which he cannot uh, do with when he's with his friends. Now, a man makes his identity in the society through his language. That's understood. So, um, his language reflects his personality, uh, his class, his nature of job, and his place in society. So, the English speaker from London differs in his pronunciation, the selection of lexicon, and the use of syntactic structure. And uh, from the speaker who belongs either to India or USA. Now, the Indian speaker um, has different ways of representation of pronunciations. So, lexicon and syntactic structure from those of both the US and UK. Now, a man living in society establishes his positions there <coughs> through language. Now, in it, uh, it is the only means of communication in the society. So, how uh, different dialects would affect it, the people uh, would uh, make their place in society uh, because of um, the way they use the language. So, um, it is only means of communication in the society. He shares his ideas, his emotions, his beliefs, his feelings, his joy, his distress through common codes prescribed for each of them in the society. Now, he learns language in the society also. He learns it through, uh, from his family, from his friends in schools. Now, in the family, he learns the native language. So, you would be learning your native language like you learn Urdu when you grow up. So, um, he shares his native language and the standard language among his friends. Then he learns the standard language in the school. So, with his friends in his family, he would use and hear only uh, the native language. Then, in, uh, with his friends, he would uh, have a combination of the native language and the standard language. And in schools, he would only learn about the standard language and use only that. Now, he learns words of common use and relations in a family. So, he shares them among friends and learns uh, about new words of sports or etc. So, in school, he learns um, the words of science and technology, economics and commerce also, uh, politics and philosophy, um, the grammatical rules and the language activities in different fields, and the difference between speech and graphic language. Now, language thus plays a very important role in society. The speakers of one language are categorized in a language community. For instance, English is spoken in so many different countries such as Britain, America and India or Pakistan. So, the English of America is different from that of uh, what's spoken in um, Britain or what's spoken in the way it's spoken in India or in Pakistan. So, similarly, Indian uh, English or Pakistani English is different from that of Britain and America. But the language is one and all of the three countries. So, therefore, the language community is one. So, you see, the language community be, would be one, but uh, the dialects would differ and the pronunciations would differ. Now, we should discuss the social linguistics in relation with the sociology of language. So, we have discussed earlier that the study of language in relation to society is the subject of social linguistics. On the contrary, now, the study of society in relation to language defines what is generally called the sociology of language. So, social linguistics throws lights on the nature of language in general and the characteristics of some language in particular. So, society in a notional little world where, uh, which has its own pattern of language and where everybody has exactly uh, the same language. So, every member of a society knows the same constructions and the same words, with the same pronunciations and the same range of meanings for every single word in the language. Now, sometimes the difference in pronunciation 
may occur in a society in uh, some situations for various reasons. Now, one reason may be a person spends some time with the person of their other societies. That's why maybe it's different. Or uh, an obvious reason is that the very young member of the society just le uh, learning to talk also uh, must necessarily be different from everybody else. But now, according to that, now child language is the domain of a branch of psychology rather than sociology. So psychology can provide general principles of language acquisition which will allow us to predict in every respect uh, the ways the language of children in this society deviates from that of the adults. So in psychology uh, we would say that if we were able um, to provide the necessary principles then uh, there would be a good deal to say about language in relation to society. Now the fourth reason of uh, language change may be the generation gap. Why? Because when we have a generation gap, you see, um, elders will speak a language in a very different way than a youngster would. When you uh, look at your friends, they have a different way of pronouncing words or they would make new words in the vocabulary and they would have a different way of uh, informally speaking that. Now, this um, is a huge uh, important thing because the generation gap makes a huge difference. Now, people speaking, let's say, Urdu, uh, in the older times, maybe in the time that your grandfather or grandmother were alive, uh, the type of Urdu they would have spoken would have been very, very traditional, would have been uh, more pure Urdu. Now, nowadays, what uh, the youngsters would speak, that's the generation gap when we see, then uh, their Urdu is not pure. They have a lot of mixing in it. They mix a lot of English words into it. They mix a lot of other uh, slang words into it. So that's how you can tell that a generation gap would have an effect also on language. So it involves uh, between the oldest and the youngest generations also now. Now, though the youngest generations carry on the form of the language, yet changes uh, occur because in language it is a natural process. So man can be distinguished from other animals because he has language to express himself. So you can express him because he can express his feelings, he can express if he's got a heart, he can express if he's in love, he can express whatever feelings he's having. Anger, sadness, distress, love, happiness. A human being is different from animals because he can express them through his language, through his speech. Now man of course learns the language in society, but the language structure always follows the social structure and culture. Now, as we have uh, discussed earlier in this chapter, the language is a reflection of social structure. Now, it reflects the depth of the personal relationship as we see in um, the Indian societies as, um, and as in representations of relationships between persons. So, every relationship has a name in Indian society which shows the depth of the relationship. Now, um, it's the similar in Pakistan. We, uh, every, we've given every relationship uh, a form, like, like Chacha would be the younger brother of your father, Taya or Tau, like an Indian, would be the older brother of your fa uh, father, Mama would be uh, like in English, you would, mom, a child would be calling his mother mama, but in um, Urdu or Hindi, um, in Indian societies, uh, the relationship, every relation has a name in Indian societies and Pakistani societies. So the depth of the relationship would be explained through the <coughs> names that they've given. So mama would be the brother of your mother. And then uh, Mausa, uh, once again, some relation from your mother's side, Jija would be your brother-in-law or what we in Pakistan in Urdu would call Benoi. Um, Sali would be your uh, wife sister. So in European languages such type of depth in relation la relationships lacks. So <clears throat> in the European culture they don't have these relationships. They don't have these names given in language according to the society or the relationships. So uh, 
they would have it uh, very few uh, relationships. Like in English, there is only the word uncle for chacha, tau, and mama. Now, here we have three different varieties, but in English, we would just be uncle. So, all three of them would be called uncle. Then um, we would have, uh, let's say, uh, for mama and mouth, uh, one name maternal uncle would be used. That means that it shows that maternal uncle. Uh, paternal would be f your uncles from your father's side, and maternal would be uh, your uncles from your mother's side. So may be used. So for Sali, Bhabi, Babu, um, there is the common word sister-in-law in English. <coughs> for Dada and Nana, there is the word grandfather. Now, in grandfather, uh, once again, uh, you would say grand grandpa or grandfather, but it doesn't say that if he's Dada or if he's Nana, like if he's your uh, paternal uh, grandfather or maternal grandfather. So usually, yes, we don't put those uh, distinctions until somebody would ask us about it. We wouldn't give that as a description that, yes, uh, he's my paternal or my um, maternal grandfather. For Nani and Dadi, there is the word grandmother. So thus the language expresses not only thoughts and feelings of the speaker, but also the social culture and the tradition. <coughs> now in Persian, plural uh, verb is used to pay respect. There is a rich man or a man of status is considered as more than one uh, common man. So in Japan specific words, so in Persian, they would say that they would use plural. Yeni, uh, Instead of saying me, they would use the word hum. Or uh, giving them a plural form, that would be giving a rich person respect. Now, in Japan, specific words um, are used for the king or his family members, which denotes the specific position of the king, which cannot be found elsewhere. Then, in social linguistics now, thus is a new branch of linguistics born out of the integral relationship between language and society. So, then when we go ahead and study about, uh, we want to see uh, grammatically, if um, grammatical accuracy or different language communities. So, in generally, um, it includes the following topics. Now, phonetics, morphology, syntax, semantics, vocabulary, proverbs, and sayings. Now, in social linguistics, um, phonetics does not refer to the mechanism of speech as we have discussed in the uh, before. So here we concentrate on speech as social interaction. Now the speech may be shorter or longer uh, strings of linguistic items uttered on specific occasions for particular purposes. Now we ignore various kinds of spoken tests in order to concentrate on what is called face-to-face -face interactions. Although we may ignore all kinds of important but impersonal communication, such as the mass media, a wide range of activities will still be left behind. So, such as conversations, quarrels, jokes, committees, meetings, interviews, introductions, lessons, teachings, chit-chat, and hostings. So, we learn our language by listening to others. Although each individual's language may have some specific characteristics, character and expression and pronunciation owing to his own experience and interaction with the speakers of other speech communities. So, but in any case, language is entirely social, being identical from one member of a speech community to another. Now, in society, speech is very important instrument of communication and uh, with each other. Now, it is a process by which children are turned into fully competent members of society. However, a good deal of culture is transmitted verbally. Now, this process of transmission of culture and tradition is known as uh, socialization. Now, there are some customs in every society which would differ from those of others also. So uh, many vocabulary level, it would be different also. So for example, in Britain, uh, we are required uh, to respond when someone else greets us. When we refer to someone, we are required to take account of uh, what the address is, uh, knows about him. 
address he knows about him now when we address a person we must choose our words uh, carefully to show the social relations between us so when someone else who is not close to us is talking we are required to keep uh, quiet or keep more or less silent but not totally so so the study of speech now as part of social interaction has involved many different disciplines for example such as social psychology sociology anthropology uh, ethnology study of behavior in animals philosophy uh, artificial intelligence the study of human intelligence via computer simulation like we studied in previous lectures so social linguistics and linguistics now all these disciplines are interrelated and have to display different roles in the society in social interaction all the disciplines have equal roles uh, through manner emotion whispering shouting we can classify the speech act on the basis of uh, manner of speaking in the following way <clears throat> for example now the general manner would be uh, speaking and talking the manner would be saying shouting or whispering in which of the way we would say so generally we would be either speaking or talking then the manner would be saying shouting or whispering the flow of information would be a green announcing asking discussing explaining ordering reminding reporting suggesting or telling the source would be acting reading reciting mimicking speaker evaluation would be apologizing boasting complaining criticizing grumbling joking or thanking and a hearer evaluation would be flattering promising teasing threatening warning and effects on the hearer would be cajoling, dissuading, and persuading. So how does this work now? When we say about speaking and talking in general, so we would say that there are different ways of either speaking with someone or talking to someone. One would be that you would be saying something. The other way would be that you would sh be shouting uh, that way, or you could be whispering it. So these are the manners in which you would produce the speech then the flow of information now the flow of information that you're doing is a green it could be a green it could be announcing it could be asking discussing explaining ordering reminding reporting suggesting or telling source would be acting reading reciting or mimicking so the source would be either you're acting about it you're reading it you're reciting something or you are mimicking matlab you aap kisi ke nakal utar rahe or you're copying someone so speaker evaluation now speaker evaluation apologizing boasting complaining criticizing grumbling joking and thanking so uh, the evaluation of the speaker would be that either he's apologizing either he's boasting that means like he's um, giving uh, showing off or he's complaining about something or he's criticizing something taking um, saying this is not right or that's not right or he's grumbling that means he's angry he's not happy or he's joking or he's thanking someone now a hearer evaluation would be flattering that either you are trying to flatter somebody kisi ki tareef karke jaise promising promising making promises teasing kisi ko tang karna chhedna threatening dhamki dena warning also dhamki so <clears throat> effect on the hearer would be either cajoling that satisfying nice dissuading that the person wouldn't agree with you or persuading now these categories of speech act are cultural concepts and so they may vary from one society to another now morphology for example when we say that okay when we are trying to discuss these things um, in let's say um, in example that uh, trying to say that in a society a language makes a difference so yes uh, language does make a difference on society so how we pronounce words how we say it if we are formal um, or if we are informal um, that also really counts a lot 
So what we want to say is that it does this relationship between language and society, does it affect our daily uh, life also? Or it doesn't. So um, what we would say is that if you want to say that um, when you are trying to threaten somebody or you're promising somebody something, do you think that at that point that uh, the place that you are in or the society that you belong from uh, would um, sort of influence the way you speak to that person? Or in which society that you are growing up, that would influence the way you speak? So these are the questions that um, you want to make sure if it is um, related or not. So what we say is that the, there are the categories of speech act are cultural concepts and uh, so they may vary from uh, one society to another. <clears throat> now morphology as we have studied in the third chapter, is the science and study of the smallest grammatical um, units of language and of their formation into words including inflection, deriv derivation and composition. Now according to Dorfman, uh, morphology is the study of the ways and methods of grouping sounds into sound complexes or words. So, um, or a definite distinct con uh, conventional meanings. So it's important in the field of social linguistics cannot be ignored. Now the chief contribution of morphology is in wild formation by affixing or compounding the smallest grammatical units or words. So the new words may be formed according to the need of the social activities. It forms syntactic uh, structure of the words in the language system. Now it also studies the history and development of word forms. <clears throat> it is one of the important aspects of social linguistics. So uh, as the communication of information and uh, thought can be possible only through language. So when we say that um, morphology is an integral unit of uh, language, then in the syntactical structure of a language, especially in English, the inflectional variations uh, in number and gender can be represented only by the addition of suffixes. So like I told you, you could, uh, there, uh, the basic English language is based on um, the roots are Greek and Latin mainly. Then you add a prefix and a suffix. Now a suffix would be when you are adding words at the end of something to either uh, change the meaning or change the context or the uh, action of the word. So in the syntactical structure of language, especially in English, uh, the inflection varies in numbers and gender and can be represented only by the uh, addition of suffixes. For example, the nouns frequently take S and ES in um, their forms to change their numbers from singular to plural. For example, like boy to boys, girl to girls, baby to babies, now etc. Now similarly, in order to change the masculine um, gender into feminine, um, we would say that uh, EWS is added to some masculine words to make them uh, feminine. For example, prince, and then you do an E. Uh, and you add an uh, double S at the end to make it princess. Then tiger, tigress. So lion, lioness. Also adding a double S. Inspector, inspectress. Etc. So verb is uh, originally uh, plural and to change into uh, it into singular, uh, we would, uh, the S or ES is added. So to change uh, tense of the verbs, usually D or ED or uh, T is added uh, as in walked, played, determined, etc. Now in some verbs, to change them into past or past partic uh, participle uh, tense form, infixes are added. Now what is an infix? An infix would be that some of uh, them uh, would be adjectives and uh, turns into adverbs by adding ly, for example, immediate adjective immediately, adverb, 
or hurried adjective hurriedly or adverb many words now get negative meanings if a few prefixes are added to them for example now legal illegal the meaning has changed you see you add a prefix prefix is always added before a root in the start and a suffix is added at the end so uh, legal if we put um, il as a prefix in it it would make it illegal but that means then it would change the word and it would become a negative form literature illiterate once again literate or illiterate proper improper moral immoral direct indirect regular irregular relevant irrelevant religious irreligious take a mistake understand misunderstand behave misbehave etc so in some words prefixes are added to give them some extraordinary or um, special meaning now some words change their original meaning so in vocabulary when we are studying a uh, language vocabulary we would say that in some words would change their uh, original meaning adding the prefixes for e example now sure over sure uh, crowded cr uh, overcrowded burst outburst cast forecast c for c ordinary extraordinary rich enrich president ex president collect recollect gain regain create recreate etc and so morphology thus then uh, this would be explaining that point of grammatical accuracy in the language vocabulary also so the third category then uh, morphology plays a very common and essential role in interaction through language it makes our communication easy and appropriate on the social level so in the third category syntax now that's the structure does not need any explanation to prove its utility in the language now the basic construction of a sentence is based on the syntax it explains the grammatical units in their appropriate place in the construction of a sentence it describes the syntactic process in the grammatical structure of a sentence according to the need conjoining or embedding of the words or the other sentences may occur in the sentences also for example now john or jack or julie will go together to attend the meeting now this is the example of conjoining now here three proper nouns have been joined by or and and <coughs> conjoining occurs when elements are added or joined to other similar elements now look at the example of embedding the tiger that killed a number of persons uh, worried the people here now that killed a number of persons has been embedded in the main sentence the tiger worried the people yes hence embedding generally occurs in the cases where the subordinate clause is said to be interrupted in the main clause <coughs> while conjoining is the phenomenon of the traditionally called coordinate clause so the application of syntax does not end here it defines the grammatical items uh, without which language cannot be comprehensible so it explains the parts of speech fixes and their position in the sentence and it would um, classify the nouns pronouns and adjectives so when we say that uh, the adverbs prepositions conjunctions and interjections and also decides um, appropriate uh, use of each of them so when we discuss that then we would say that um, syntax has a real effect on um, words grammatically now the verbs are uh, let's say that uh, the verbs would be uh, the ones that show the action of a certain person so um, the verbs are considered as the soul of a sentence because it's showing what a subject is doing exactly
So um, let's say that the application of syntax does not end here. Now, when you look at uh, conjoining occurs when elements are added or joined. So um, interrupted in the main clause while conjoining is the phenomenon of the traditionally called coordinate. Uh, clause. So the application of syntax uh, does not end here. It defines the grammatical items. Now, when we are saying grammatical accuracy, then we are going to be uh, learning about the uh, grammatical items and without which language cannot be comprehensible. Now, it explains the parts of speech and fixes their position in the sentence. So it classifies the nouns, pronouns, adjectives, verbs, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, interjections, and also the appropriate use of each of them. Now, syntax is uh, the traditional grammar which studies, uh, which studies uh, the application of parts of speech grammatically. Now, the verbs are considered as the soul of a sentence. So we would say that yes. And a sentence may be possible without any parts of the speech, but only uh, with a verb. Now, for example, go, play, sleep, and hurry are that. Uh, a sentence cannot be imagined without a verb, for example. Uh, Julie, he, hijack, and Julie immediate cannot be uh, said sentences either. So the verb should uh, also be placed at the right place in the sentence in order to make it meaningful. So that's how grammatical accuracy would be uh, gained. If we misarrange the part of speech in a sentence, it would be meaningless or incorrect. So for example, in the sentence Ranu um, school went to yesterday, all the required words are available, but the arrangement of the word in the sentence is ungrammatical. Ranu went, school went to yesterday. So what would we say? How would you correct that? We would say that Ranu went to school yesterday. That would be grammatically right. So therefore it is meaningless and incorrect. Now the sentence Rano um, went to school yesterday is grammatically correct and meaningful. So semantics is the meaning of a sentence. Now this is the key purpose of a language. It is the study of the meaning and its manifestation in a language. As uh, Manfred Burnish describes, the semantics uh, should make reference to the syntactic structure in a precise way and it should uh, represent systematically the meaning of a single word. So it should show how the structure of the meaning of words and the syntactic relations interact in order to constitute the interpretation of sentences. And it should indicate how these interpretations are related to the things spoken about. A semanticist finds out how a man is able to paraphrase, uh, transform or detect ambiguities and why the surrounding words sometimes force him to choose one interpretation rather than another. So semantics also studies synonyms, antonyms, homonyms, polysemy, anomalies, etc. So all these items are essential requirements of a language, especially English, uh, to make it suitable. So comprehensible and attractive also. So both syntax and semantics are important in the formation of the appropriate sentence and finally the language. So a grammatically correct sentence may be meaningless, for example. Uh, a man killed a tiger and ate away. Now this sentence is grammatically correct but not, uh, does not convey the convincing meaning. Now, a man may kill a tiger, but he cannot eat the tiger. So the order of words should be a tiger killed a man and ate away. Now, logically, this sentence is meaningful and grammatically uh, correct. Hence, to understand the meaning of a sentence, one must know not only the meaning of its lexical element, but also how they interrelate with each other. So, um, Rigveda describes meanings as the essence of language and the speech without meaning has been called the tree without fruits and flowers. So the true meaning of a word is to be found by observing what a man does with it, so not what he says about it. So, or it must be contextual or functional. So, so the meaning of a word 
uh, is its use in the language. Now, the, how we use the uh, word in a language. Now, the words should be uh, studied according to their functions. In the context, they would occur. So, as a matter of fact, the operational approach deals with meanings in speech. Uh, the referential with meanings in language. The functional approach treats words as tools. And it incorporates the speaker and hearer, the actions they are performing at the time, and the various external objects and events uh, in terms of context and situation. Then um, the meaning of utterances uh, include both reference and den den denotation of individual words and the meaning of the whole sentence. It also deals with the differences in personal status, the family and social relations and uh, degrees of intimacy and relative age and other factors which uh, may be considered as the essential matters of social linguistic representation. Now when we talk about language vocabulary, vocabulary is the most essential tool of a language without uh, which it is a mere imagination. Now all the um, grammatical rules and even the ungrammatical expressions can be imagined only if the stock of vocabulary is available. Now any type of communication in the society requires the stock of vocabulary which we can learn in society and family. But the family and society provide only the essential vocabulary which we use in a day-to-day -day language. So to make a uh, stock of vocabulary we may have to use a dictionary. So dictionaries have traditionally been the only source of human uh, information on language for a majority of people. So it provides us words, their pronunciation, synonyms, their form in different parts of speech, etc. So the process of making um, a dictionary is known as lexography. So there are a number of dictionaries, monolingual and bilingual, available in the market. Uh, for example, uh, Oxford Advanced um, Learner's Dictionary, Concise Oxford Dictionary, the Webster's Dictionary are the few of the non-monolingual uh, dictionaries and um, Bharagava's uh, Standard Illustrated Dictionary of the English uh, Language, Sahani's uh, Advanced Dictionary, etc are the examples of a few bilingual dictionaries. So every language has its own vocabulary. So the vocabulary may represent the social, cultural and traditional attitudes uh, of the people of that language community. Now the language of one isoglass may also may have resemblance from that of the neighboring isoglass. It may also be proved a strange language for the speakers of the distinct uh, isoglasses. So with regular contact between uh, language communities, um, we would say that a mixed language and a mixed uh, culture develop in the society also. Now it may also be developed uh, due to marriage between two language communities. Most often the female has to adopt the language and culture of that of her husband. So in that situation, she does not forget the language and culture which she has uh, inherited from her parents. So the effect of this mixed culture and language grows among the children. Now, every language has some proverbs and sayings which represent the custom uh, or the society. So uh, the following are a few proverbs and sayings taken from English language. Action speaks louder than words. That means that um, whatever the way you would act, it uh, speaks louder than uh, words, than you would say it in words. Absent makes the heart grow fonder. That means you miss somebody more when you, the person isn't there. Beggars can't be choosers. When you don't have a choice, then uh, you have to go with something. A bird in the hand is uh, worth two in a bush. Birds of feather flock together. Blood is thicker than water. We use that when we say with our family that blood is thicker than water, that even brother and sisters would be um, joined together in a more close way. Born with silver spoon in your mouth, that means that you were born with all the luxuries that your parents provide. Charity begins at home. Every cloud has a silver lining. The early bird catches the worm. Now the proverbs 
and saints in particular. So, a uh, detailed explanation of that would be the exotic character of the language, the familiar language, the language communities, and language in relation to society. Now, these are the things I'm going to explain right now to you. So, in a detailed explanation of the proverbs, the proverbs and sayings in a particular language are the versions uh, said by someone who possessed a great personality. <coughs> these proverbs and sayings are uh, didactic and often communicate some moral message in the society. Now most of the people use them very frequently to justify their statements or to guide uh, their children. Now sometimes they are used to pass some comments on others. They are socially justified and accepted. Uh, the purpose of their formation is to retain a common moral uh, value in the society. So these are the basis of the social structure and the customs of a society. If someone says something in the society, it may not lay emphasis or may not uh, be very effective unless he makes some sayings of great men or of the popular proverbs. So the sayings and proverbs um, <clears throat> justify his statement. Some of the sayings and most of the proverbs are anonymous. And even then, they have been accepted by the society considering their tested uh, appeal. So then we move on to uh, study about the exotic character of language. Now, when we are studying the exhaust, exotic character of language, we would say in a society, all the people speak uh, the same language. And on the basis of which they are considered as the speakers belonging to one speech community. Now, they use common words uh, in their common meaning. Their pronunciation is also almost the same, and uh, but this characteristic cannot be true in all societies. So we um, may cite the example of the area northwest of Amazon. That would be geographically each half of this area lies both in Brazil and Colombia. Now co coinciding more or less with the area in which the language called uh, Tucano is uh, spoken as a lingua franca or non-native language. It is a large area where around 10,000 people are sparsely inhabited. Most of the people are indigenous American Indians divided into over 20 tribes, so which are in turn grouped into five others. So five another. So um, each tribe speaks a different language, which is not mutually comprehensible to uh, the other tribes. So it shows all these languages have not been descended from a common parent language. The language distinction in the main and only criterion by which uh, tribes can be distinguished from one another. Um, the other characteristic of that area is that they, there are 20 uh, odd tribes which are exogamous or a man must not marry a woman from the same tribe and the wife has to live where the husband lives. So the wife is also bound to speak the language of her husband. Such a custom may be called um, paralingual marriage. Now here the woman cannot <coughs> teach her own language to her children. And the mother tongue of the woman appears as a foreign language. Now in these circumstances, uh, one can hardly call the children's first language as their mother tongue. So, except by the stretch of imagination. Now, these languages um, have never uh, remained a matter of in external influences. So, they um, transmitted efficiently um, and accurately by the influence of the father. So, the mother's uh, language has nothing whatsoever to do with it. And it's all about the father's language. In his relatives and the older uh, children, since the woman lives with her husband in the house, uh, there is no shortage of contacts with the native speakers of the husband's language. Uh, 
So, but such trends of social setup create trouble in easy communication. Now, if the people of uh, one tribe go to visit another tribe, uh, they would have to use a lingua franca or Tikana for communication because they uh, would have to use a common language. Now, even when one visits in his, um, his in-law's house, he will face difficulty in communication. If a visitor comes to one's uh, residence even to find a partner, he can be expected to speak at least the parental language of that family, uh, the mother's uh, language which he might have been taught by his mother, or the lingua franca, um, Tukana, which may be the father's or the mother's language. So, however, in addition to the aspects of interaction which are directly related to multilingualism, there are several other problems to be said about the relationship between speech and the social circumstances of this complex Amazon society. So, for example, there is a custom that if they, you are listening to someone um, whom you respect, you should repeat after them and word for word for the first few minutes everything they say. And, um, there are about 6,000 languages uh, in 160 nations. It shows that every nation has a number of languages, so one language cannot serve the purpose of a communication um, even within a state. So, therefore, almost all the people are multilingual. Even one language has variations in pronunciation and syntactical and lexical structure due to the variations in culture. Now, there may be some different uh, interferences uh, of the native dialect and the social customs in the language. Now, in a standard language, such minute differences may be found in very least numbers. So, in a view of uh, the need for communication with the neighboring countries, communities uh, then, or the government agencies, it is fair to assume that members, many members of the most communities are multilingual. So, and then we talk about the familiar language. Now, familiar language, the familiar language is the language in, and the language communities and the language in relation to society. So, the familiar language is the language which you speak in your family, among your friends in your native village or town. Now, this language is influenced by the culture, custom, and so many other things. For example, <clears throat> what are the names of the relations? Like I said in Urdu and Hindi, we do have those, uh, the names for different relations, but um, in English we don't. What do uh, the people who um, of that place eat? How do they behave with the stranger? Are they friendly or are they not friendly? What are the ways of their talking to uh, young ch uh, children? How do they speak to younger children? Uh, do they speak any other language? How do they greet the strangers? Are there different ways of pronouncing any of the words according to where they came, come from? And there, if there is any other way of showing that they are quoting any others in answering the above questions. So we have to think not only about the language but also about one or another uh, aspect of the society that uses it. So such type of questions um, may make readers aware of how much there is to say about their language in relation to society. So finally, the language has social functions also. The formation of language is purposeful and uh, the only purpose of the uh, social interaction uh, the language not only functions as a means to communicate or share our ideas, feelings, emotions, and so on, but this also preserves our culture, heritage, and it acts like an equilibrium uh, force which helps us to make contact with different um, societies of different language communities in the world. So it also helps us. Uh, to express ourselves providing uh, us our own identity in the society, Thus, both language and society are essential elements of human generation. And a human, beings, a, a, a human being is different from all other living animals because he has a language to represent himself and a society to provide him all essentials of life. Now, there will uh, not be the existence of society uh, without um, its own language. So, in other words, a language uh, also loses its own identity without the society. So, hence the language and society are respectively the soul and body of humanity. 
If the society is the body and the language is its soul, thus the study of language in relation to society is a very important wing in the study of linguistics. So though every branch of linguistics, whatever we have discussed earlier, is a part of social linguistics, uh, it, it was not much known earlier. So uh, most of the growth in this field has taken place since the late 1960s, like I've told you before so many times. Now, they, uh, though there is a long tradition in the study of uh, the dialects and um, of the relations between word meaning and culture. So both are counted under social linguistics uh, by our definition. Now what is new is the widespread interest in social linguistics nowadays and the realization that it can throw much light both on the nature of the language and of society. So now social linguistics has become a recognized part of most courses on linguistic or language at universal level and is indeed one of the main growth points in the society uh, study of language. So from the uh, point of view of both teaching and research, the study of linguistics in uh, the present day cannot be said complete without including social linguistics as one of the integral subjects of it. So when we move on then we would say that however everyday use of the Alsatian is a strong marker of the local identity. Now it is important part of being Alsatian in France. So we can contrast the situation uh, with uh, that in another area of France. In uh, Brittany, we would say that um, a separatist movement, that is a movement for local autonomy, if not complete independence, is centered uh, on Britain, a language which unfortunately for those who speak it is in serious decline. So Britain identity no longer has the support of widespread use of a language. So the various relations, uh, relationship among languages and dialects discussed above can be um, used to show how the concepts of power and solidarity help us understand what is happening in this or uh, that power requires some kind of uh, asymmetrical relationship between entities. So one has more or of something that is important. So maybe status or money or influence, etc., than the others or the other. So a language has more power than any of its dialects. It is the powerful dialect, but it has become so because of the non-linguistic factors. So standard English and Persian French are good examples of this also. Solidarity on the other hand is a feeling of equality that people have with one another. They have a common interest around which they will bond and a feeling of solidarity can lead people to preserve a local dialect or an endangered uh, language to resist power or to insist on independence. So it accounts for the persistence of local dialects, the modernization of Hebrew and the separation of Serbo-Croatian into serbian croatian The language, we would say, and the dialect situation along the border uh, between the Netherlands and uh, Germany is an interesting one also. So historically there was a continuum of dialects of uh, one language but the two that eventually become standardized as the languages of the Netherlands and Germany. So standard Dutch and standard uh, German are not mutually intelligible. That is a speaker of one cannot understand a speaker of the other. So in the border area speakers of the local varieties of Dutch and German still exist within that dialect continuum and remain largely intelligible to one another. So yet the people on one side of the border say they speak a variety of Dutch and those on the other side uh, say they speak a variety of German. So even though they're on the uh, border they would say that on the border of uh, Dutch and Germany they would say that in the border area speakers would uh, have local varieties of Dutch and German that it would still exist and within the dialect continuum and remain largely intelligible to one another. So 
<coughs> what we want to say is that so these you can see the languages how they differ and um, they would speak a variety of Dutch and those on the other side would speak a variety of German. So social linguistics is a branch of uh, linguistics which is uh, the relation between the societies and the language and language changes its form and structure on the basis of social conditions also like I said in explaining in German language and all that. So uh, for example social class, gender, religion and cultural groups a particular uh, social group may speak a different variety of a language from the rest of the community. So maybe Dutch people can speak differently uh, from what uh, Germans would speak or like we said that there are three different varieties of German languages. So um, and such a group of speakers under, comes under the head of speech community. So it's a German speech community, but may be spoken in different ways. The variation in language as such may occur due to the differences in class or status. So the speaker belonging to the educated and higher class may have different ways of speaking of the same language in comparison with that of those belonging to the uneducated and the lower class. A language also varies among the speakers that belong to different geographical regions also with respect to their pronunciations. Now for example the English spoken in London varies from that of in the regions spoken in the same country for example received pronunciation. A variety of spoken English is used in the southwest of England and is particularly associated with the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. So uh, you can see that there is a difference between uh, even in the British English when they are speaking in Yorkshire or London it would uh, they would or Lancashire they would pronounce the words in a different way. So uh, American Indian and Australian English also have different pronunciations so and uh, different variations. So social linguistics would study all of these variations and changes in a language. So uh, that is enough for today, students, and then we will continue social linguistics in our coming lecture also. Thank you. Good day.